This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning to you all. To anybody who wherever you are in the world, a very warm welcome from sunny South Africa here at, and beyond in Gala. What we have here is a beautifully big elephant. And I mean, for such a big animal, he seems to have hidden himself quite well behind this little bush. He seems to be feeding quite happily and comfortably. Just going along his business, he's got an incredibly beautiful pair of tusks. They're quite large as well. I'm just hoping he kind of pulls himself out and we get to have a great look at them. But a very warm welcome to your very own live safari from the African bush. Welcome back and now I'm just you can see that tail kind of swishing and flicking there and I mean he's an incredibly big elephant he seems to be as I was saying earlier very well hidden he did walk through I'd love him to kind of show us his tusks a little bit you can just see him shaking and pushing some of those trees it's something to if you were just driving and weren't looking out you'd drive right past him without ever knowing potentially a five-ton animal just standing on our right-hand side feeding quite close probably about 30 meters away or so but good morning everybody i'm daniel fisher and on camera this morning we've got od and plans for this morning i'm kind of heading into the east i mean the river will be crossable this morning so i'm going to head out into the eastern part of the reserve looking for lions hopefully the birmingham pride or even the birmingham breakaway pride but a great way to start this morning with this lovely big elephant bull and he initially started as lots of the elephants are doing at the moment underneath the marula tree it looked like there was still a few marulas on that one in particular and i mean the fruiting season of the marula trees creates large amounts of joy in these elephants particularly the bulls they'll often go right up to the tree put their head up against it and push it and shake it until they drop some marulas and then they'll be quite fastidious with how they move around the tree kind of picking up individual fruits and they'll be very sure to not forget leave any out and yeah i mean he'll keep going throughout the morning and feeding from marula to marula occasionally moving it's interesting to see him feeding on that tree it looked like a bush willow from here and listen to him breaking the branches that's something that would give his kind of position away if you're driving you might be able to hear the snapping of a branch even as i was saying earlier you know how i was telling you how they push it put their head up against maybe he'll show us his tusks here now look at that He's come on the right hand side there. There he goes. Look at the size of those tusks. Let's see if I can't reverse a little bit here and get another view of them. Let's just have a look because he is quite magnificent and majestic. Oh. Oh, he stopped to go to the bathroom as well. That gives us a good chance to get ahead of him. Liam, do elephants breathe through their trunks or their mouths? They can breathe um, through their trunks very easily. And that's where they'll do the majority of their breathing. You'll see when they are in the water or trying to drink. Here he comes. That's actually a really good position. Um, they can blow lots of bubbles through their trunk. And they can certainly breathe through. Even when they're crossing rivers, you'll see they use their trunks as kind of like a snorkel to breathe. Here he comes right towards us. What a magnificent shot, actually. Look, he's got one of those pieces of bush willow, it looks like, in his mouth still. I'm sure he's feeding on the bark. Yes, it's quite amazing, actually. How incredible is this that he's coming right towards us? I might make a little bit of space for him. As he comes right towards us, 
Oops, there's a tree. It's a little bit close to me. He is the boss here. He is much bigger than I am and much stronger than I am. And I'm not going to... He even might be in must, in fact. And in that case, I'm going to be extra cautious about the space that I give him. And it's more about respect towards this animal. I don't want to put any unnecessary pressure and stresses on him. You see how he's kind of walking as well. I'm trying to see if he is in musty. It does look like between his back legs, that penile sheath is dripping. Let's see if Odie... I can't smell him. You often smell them quite strongly when they are in must like that. But that kind of behavior, you see him flopping his trunk over his tusks. He is a big bull, swaying from side to side. That kind of behavior is a good suggestion to him being in must. And I didn't see when he was initially feeding in the trees. Is he in must? He might be coming just in and out of must. Maybe he was just urinating there for a little bit, but I don't, it's interesting to see if he is or isn't in must. I'll get back to you on that. But in the meantime, while I try and reposition and have another look, I'm going to send you to a place where you're going to see what the weather's doing like at all our live locations this morning. from Tsualu. This is uh, our regular uh, dam at uh, Tsualu with our uh, Egyptian geese. Uh, you with me uh, on live safari, Deirdre, and on camera today, Morgan again. <laughs> Hello Morgan, there we go. <laughs> so uh, our plan for this morning is uh, see what's happening around the dam, but then uh, when uh, the sun starts popping up over the mountains. We'll head up and see if we can find a meerkat update for everyone this morning. We haven't seen them in a few days. With yesterday's rain, they went uh, went down early, especially if it's uh, cold, wet and windy. Uh, then they head to bed quite early. So we'll see uh, who pops out this morning. We'll probably follow up on the Makalas. So. Just a really nice uh, little Egyptian goose family. They've done quite well there. She's got uh, eight goslings. Um, and already to get them to that size, uh, she's done uh, quite well. I think that there's water bodies all over the place, so there's not too much competition for uh, spots at the moment. But there you can see much bigger already. That'll probably be oh, more than a month or more in age. So they'll be looking for any sort of aquatic, either insects, snails, vegetation. And uh, yesterday we were talking about a bird that spends a lot of its time grooming. Uh, and Egyptian geese are one of those. They'll spend over 20% of their day uh, grooming their feathers. And funnily enough, uh, probably 15% or more um, in territorial behavior. So just making sure that uh, every other Egyptian goose knows that they're uh, the owners of the dam. So they would be chicks that would be precocial. So I think I heard Cleo is asking what's the difference between a duck and a goose. Um, it generally tends to be believed to be about size, so a goose being bigger than a duck, uh, and a goose tends to sort of honk and hiss uh, more, uh, and, a, and a duck quacks, as, as strange as that sounds. <laughs> but it does, uh, it is more about the size. So the Egyptian goose, we get the spur wing goose as well, um, which is uh, probably about four times the size of an Egyptian goose. That's our biggest goose in Southern Africa. Then the Egyptian goose and then everybody else uh, tends to fall in the duck category for us. Let's see what else is around on the dam. I'm just going to scan around while Morgan show you. So I was talking about the chicks being precocial and precocial means that they're pretty much uh, independent finding food from the word go. But 
We're going to head across to the meerkats and see uh, who pops out. We're going to send you to Lauren that would like to say good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve. It's a glorious morning. Why? Well, we've came across this magnificent bull, and as Davi's about to show you, there is promise of blue sky. Lots of promise, and it's warm, so I am happy. My name is Lauren, and I do have Davi on camera. We've just stopped on quarantine. We've came across this gorgeous bull who's very relaxed, he looks very dark, actually, and what that means is that he's obviously been near water. I think he's had a little splash or a little bath at some point. So we have lots of plans for today. We can't travel too far, but I'm going to do my very best to visit the hyenas and to also possibly scratch around for the Inkopumas, as there's rumours that they may have crossed into Juma. I have not seen the Inkopumas in a very, very long time. But of course, we are live and interactive. So I must remind you to please talk to us. Send in your wonderful questions that make us think and all your lovely, lovely comments. And how you do that is use the hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter, at FC, at Final Control, at FC on the YouTube chat. Or if you're under 18, please, please do talk to us. Your questions are often the best. And you send them in via email. And that email address is kidsquestions at wildearth.tv. There's another option for you all. You can actually register on the Wild Earth website. You just head over to the live safari page and submit your questions there. Lots and lots of options for you. And of course, we're coming to you live from many different locations. Steve will be on Dam Cam today. And we also have Deirdre in Swalu, Mike in Pridelands, and Dan at Ngala. So hopefully we do get to keep up with the Inkohumas, and hopefully our masts will be getting fixed soon, which means we can traverse a lot further. So it's just a good day all round, shall we say. Look at this boo, could not be more relaxed. I don't see any other elephants on quarantine. It's just a lone bull. Some of our bulls we recognize out here because just like leopards, just like lions, as they get older, they start their ears start to tear and that gives them key identifiable features. The ears are paper thin after all. Sorry, Gwen, we have comms break up there. Can you just repeat that? Glenn, you're asking, did he sleep? Most likely, yes. They don't sleep in long bouts like we do, where we put our head in the pillow and wake up eight hours later, if it's been a good night, of course. But absolutely, we'll have rested. Elephants can snooze standing up. As they get older, you tend to find that they won't lie down as much. And it's probably because it's very difficult to get back up again. You find the youngsters, even the teenagers, lying down quite a lot. It's not so common to see the very, very old cows and bulls lying down on their side. But Jesse absolutely will have snoozed. And they can sleep standing up. So he can probably just rest against a tree and have a little nap. It's very ideal. Okay, so we're going to quickly check the hyena den. It's a little bit late, so I'm not sure if it'll be active, but we may as well check. And for now, we're going to send you across to Mike to say good morning. Oh, while we're not at a hyena den, we have got some hyenas right here in front of us. It's a semi floof a sub-adult hyena, still very, very young. I think it's one of the ones that terrorizes our camp, carrying off pots and pans and students' backpacks on a regular occasion. But we're back on Impala Plains, just wondering what's piqued the interest of these hyenas. There's more than one. There should be about three of them. Can't find the other two at the moment, but they're around somewhere. Hi, everyone. My name is Mike Anderson. Behind the camera is Gert, and you've joined us at Eco Training's Pride Lens Conservancy. 
Well, we did come here to try and find Lagatha the lioness, who we left last night just on the southern end of this clearing, but we haven't found her, but we have these hyenas. There's another youngster is now approaching its sibling, I suppose. There was a very large pregnant female that just came galloping through the clearing. I can hear another hyena calling from north of us in the direction that these ones are looking. I wonder what's happening here. I wonder if Lagatha didn't catch something last night. See, it's a little bit of a misty morning this morning. It's The temperature's dropped nicely. It's nice and cool, probably somewhere around the mid-twenties. Very pleasant. With hardly even the hint of a breeze, which means that the sound of these hyenas will be traveling super far. So these that we're hearing might be coming from a long, long way away. So that hyena in the background there is even younger. It's still got a little bit of black fur on its feet. Fiona, we have seen three different hyena dens being used, and although they were active when we saw them, those are all from one clan of hyenas. So Pride Lands basically is dominated by one single large clan of hyenas, very powerful clan, with at least 13 adults, 12 to 13, well, at least 13 individuals, including youngsters, at one den at one time, and there's almost certainly more than that who went to the den. But each of those dens gets used in intervals. As soon as it starts becoming full of ticks and parasites and smells really bad, they'll stop using it and then they'll move to a different den. And then there are also satellite dens which they use. And there's probably, I know at least at one of the big den sites there was a satellite den. What I'm going to do is just try and reverse us a little bit so we can get a view of these youngsters as they head up towards our boundary. They are not, they are looking towards the sound of these other hyenas, which are very far away. So I wonder, I just thought I heard something for a second, just switched off. <laughs> that does not look impressed. shrubs and bushes around here, so we're going to lose visual of these youngsters now. I don't think we're really going to get a very good view as they head towards our boundary, but there's one there. Just moving off in the direction of where those other hyenas are calling. I can only wonder what they are going to find. But you can see those ears perked up and that long neck looking over the grass. They're quite young, so I don't think they're going to rush into that, whatever that calling is. They're probably just going to take their time and try and figure it out. Imagine having your own secluded African bush home where you and your friends can enjoy the ultimate safari experience. If you sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer, this could become a reality. Tumbeta House is located in the heart of Juma Private Game Reserve, the home of Wild Earth. You could win a chance to stay at this intimate wilderness retreat, offering you the rare and highly sought-after privilege of your own home in the bush. The prize includes three nights for six people and includes daily game drives, a chance to see the Wild Earth Camp and have dinner with one of our guides. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer before the end of February 2021 and you could be heading to Juma, the place that we call home. Available dates are limited, so terms and conditions apply. So in 1998, we had this idea to go and put a live web camera on a waterhole somewhere in the Sabi Sands next to the Kruger National Park. And I approached just about every single landowner and everybody thought I was completely crazy until I met Yuri and Pippa Moorman. 
We thought it was definitely a fun idea and a worthwhile thing to experiment. And it immediately became a runaway success. And it gave people all around the world the opportunity to watch a little piece of Africa, day and night. Back in 1998, it was the very early stages of the internet. And all we were able to do was to get a 30 second refreshing JPEG out of that camera. But over time, what we began to do is focus more and more on trying to develop this concept of giving people the opportunity to go on safari. Even though we live just 500 meters up this hill, we still put the camera on to see what's happening. Absolutely, we watch it <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tristan Dix and I am a guide here at Juma Private Game Reserve for Wild Earth. We love connecting you to the African bush and we always look forward to all of your questions. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, you'll need to register on the website. Once registered, go to our live safari page and submit a question below the live feed. Catch up with me on Wild Earth. <laughs>
And as I said, normally you get a very quick glimpse. And if you don't know what you're kind of talking about, you won't, you won't be able to ID it because they are so quick. So look at that streaking all the way down its chest. Long, long bill. They'll use that to kind of fish for frogs and small little fish almost stabbing at them. And you'll see it can extend its neck quite high. It's got a really long neck. Jeez, it's one of the better views I think I've ever had of one of these dwarf buttons. And so strange to see it right at the top of the tree. As I said, you normally see it kind of wading around in the long grass. And because of how secretive and shy they are, they'll try and hide from absolutely anything and everything. I wonder if this little pan, the pan that it flew out of was right in the road. I'm sure it's just waiting to go back there. And if it was in the pan, I'm sure we wouldn't be able to see it at all, in fact. It's a beautiful bird, though. I think I'm not even going to show you it in the book because we've got such a good view here. Stuck in bed, it looks like a penguin, and it's just stopped in the road. Let's have a look here. Please don't fly, little guy. Please don't. You've just given us an even better view. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Wow. You see, it looks like a penguin, a tiny little penguin. Look at it move. Look at those orange legs. Tiny little thing though, hey? Moving, and it's amazing how that neck can go down and look like quite a small bird. And then it can extend its neck and then look quite big. Look at it moving into the, the pan that it flew out of. That's exactly what it just waited for us to move away from its pan. Look into the long grass and it's in the road. And I'm sure you've been hearing, particularly in the evenings, oh, and this fly, I'm sure you can hear it as well, buzzing around my head. Look at that little pan right in the middle of the road. The amount of frogs at the moment are unbelievable. And this little guy will be feeding on the smaller frogs, maybe some tadpoles that are just developing into frogs. And this might be our last view of it as it disappears into that grass. How's that color on the back though? I'd be interested to see what kind of color you think it is. I think it's like a, a dark navy blue. Look how carefully it walks as well, hey? Slowly moving its legs, being sure not to disturb anything. Edward, you get buttons in Canada as well. So you get buttons, you'll get buttons all over the world, in fact. In South Africa, the ones that come through, we get a Eurasian button, which will come from Europe as well. Then the dwarf button, which this one is, and a little button. So those are the buttons that we see around. But as I said, and I'm sure the behavior in Canada is very similar to this one in terms of how shy they are and how they hunt and move. And you see how carefully, it's got big feet moving through the grass and you see how it can just disappear i mean it's not even really trying to hide from us but it's now gone so what an amazing sighting actually of a dwarf button so already i don't know if you want to pop a chair into the book i'll just show you the dwarf button and the other buttons that we have around here so this dwarf but <laughs> let me just turn that down so this is the dwarf button up here, the Eurasian button, which is a little bit more brown, like the ones you might get up in Canada, and the little button, which sometimes people can confuse with the dwarf button and the colors, a little bit more orange. Here's that dwarf button with that very obvious streaking over there. But I'm going to keep going this morning. I mean, let's let that dwarf button go back into its little grass patch there. I'm going to send you over to Steve to say hello and good morning. Good morning, and good morning, and welcome to Final Control Dam Cam Update. And it is a beautiful morning, and my name is Steve Falkenbridge in the driver's seat. And we just thought we'd spend a moment having a look at the dawn as it emerges from the east. We haven't seen the sun in a few days. So blessed to be the morning with the sun shines in the east. We've had lots and lots of rain. Rain is necessary, everybody. But as we know, we've had a very wet year, so a few days of sunshine will be most welcome. We expected this second front of rain after the cyclone, and hopefully 
hopefully that's it for now I'm supposed to be canoeing the Orange River in April and the images of the Ochrabis Falls in the Northern Cape into Namibia are next level insane so I think it's going to be pretty wild by the time April comes but a few of my friends are feeling a little bit worried Pikamam it is a very beautiful scenery isn't it allow you just a moment there with the dawn it is going to be a beautiful day it's going to be rather warm and I have no doubt incredibly humid Good question, Henry. Well, a water hole is basically anything that holds water. So there are diff different types of watering holes. Dam being one where the a berm has been created in a river depression so as to hold the water. And that is a berm, a big dam wall over there. So that is a dam, because the water has been dammed. And then many different types of watering holes can exist, whereby maybe a pan has formed, hence like this one over here, Juma Pan, where it looks a lot more natural. Obviously, it could have been excavated out, or it could have been created by elephants. And that right now is a seasonal pan that is flooded with water. So seasonal, meaning obviously ephemeral, meaning only with the rains. And there's no water supplemented to this, although there used to be. Um, I believe this formed a leak and was leaking and was costing too much in water to keep it going. So Juma built a second one over here. And this one is being created in a way that it's not going to leak. So that is what we'll call a pan, but it is a pumped pan, which means water is provided. But across the world you get wetland systems and natural seasonal pans that will flood and inundate with the, with the years but uh, what's become a very common thing in the late 1800s into the 1900s and so on is man's need to save and secure water you look around the world and water is saved everywhere by everybody and they often prevent it from going downstream to people who might need it downstream so there are huge ecological sort of consequences behind the formation of dams because this water here could naturally have flowed out but it is now stored here so it changes the ecology no doubt wherever you change any element of the environment you're going to change the ecology so that's a little watering hole 101 The little puddle is a watering hole as well. A river is a watering hole for a period of time. But essentially the water normally flows out, but sometimes there might be rocks within the river that will hold that water and sustain it. And that's dependent on rainfall seasonality. LJ, most people in the world drink from dams, to be honest. Most of the water you'll get in any city, cities can't sustain themselves without dam. So that water has to be filtered from. Generally, it's filtered due to the fact that there's so many environmental conditions taking place. I mean, I could, we could drink from this right here. Um, my, my tummy is pretty strong when it comes to, to water. As this starts to deteriorate, to get less and less and less, I'd probably prevent my, uh, avoid drinking it. But that is drinkable, and um, all the water in the world is secured from dams, believe it or not. 
There are enormous dams in the world. Many of the cities around the world are powered by hydroelectric uh, power plants, which is basically water falling from dam walls to the bottom, which creates enormous amounts of turbulence or turbine pressure, creates electricity. So to be able to support people and the, the livelihoods that people have these days, most people drink water from borehole or dam, um, but it needs to be filtered. And boreholes are generally quite good because they've come through the sand. They've been filtered through the sand. So they take out a lot of the organic pollutants with regards to animal dung and all those sort of pathogens that might be sort of waterborne and go through the sediment. But uh, most of the water around the world is provided to cities via sort of massive catchment dam areas. So, but after the rainy season, much of the water around here is drinkable uh, but something that you'll notice is when you spend your life in a city where water is managed for you you actually lose the ability to drink real water well, talking about that my brother who lives at Edinburgh he came to South Africa he he got quite sick just drinking the normal water I was drinking in the Kruger he just wasn't able to stomach it because his water's been filtered, filtered, filtered to the point where he just hasn't been able to deal with what natural water is. I know that sounds quite crazy, but the natural biomes in one's stomach are not designed to be drinking chlorinated. Because essentially water that's treated is filled with fluoride and chlorine, and that kills all of the living component. And water is a living entity, everybody, although water itself is not living. It carries an enormous amount of living material and minerals and if we filter it out to the point where there's no minerals left and all the biological community is gone we're essentially just inhaling a liquid which lacks all of the other beneficial energy supplements and uh, living components that the animals sustain themselves off of and we should as well so I quite happily drink from these watering holes. Um, I'd probably choose this one in front over the big one at the back because there's less hippo activity. But um, in saying that as well, my stomach constitution is quite strong. I've been living off of borehold water for a long time. And so my tummy is quite well adapted to it. Okay, well, we're going to sit here and we're going to drink coffee while we man at the dam cam and we're going to send you over to Lauren. I'm very jealous, Steve. I would like some coffee. Send us some, please. Now, I had this the other day, but unfortunately, we had humongous tech problems. We have an exoskeleton. And it appears, I think, to be an exoskeleton of a praying mantis. Now, we found this does not mean that the insect that well, the skeleton that the insect belonged to, no, the other way around, the insect that the skeleton belonged to is dead. It's most likely just molted. Insects molt in order to get bigger. The exoskeleton that we're looking at is basically composed of chitin. Chitin's a really common material in the animal kingdom and it's very, very hard. It's actually a polymer. It's a polymer of acetyl glucosamine, just in case you were interested. And it's very, very resistant to chemicals. It's very resistant to dehydration. And of course, in order to grow, when the insect starts to get larger and larger, it's going to bump into resistance from a hard exoskeleton. So they have to get rid of that. They have to shed their exoskeleton in order to get bigger. So I think this is what we have here. The exoskeleton from an individual that was just molten, not necessarily an individual that has died. Isn't it fascinating? You can see all the remarkable details. And when an insect molts, it's quite a process. It's not always a fast one. Even when you look at reptiles, actually, when they shed their skin, it's not fast. It's not a fast process. And the epidermis actually separates from the cuticle, and the cuticle is part of the exoskeleton. 
in the epidermis itself is going to form the new cuticle. So separation has to start before a new cuticle can form because the insect cannot be completely exposed. Once it molds and gets rid of that exoskeleton, it cannot be vulnerable and skeletonless. So there's a process. Separation starts, but it's still got the old exoskeleton for protection. But then that epidermis is forming a new cuticle. And in order to completely get rid of the old one when the time is right, this happens through muscular contractions. Very similar to a snake, if you think. They've got to sort of pull their way out of their old skeleton. So they'll contract their muscles and they'll also take in air. They'll pump air into their body using the tracheal system. And this causes the body to swell, of course, because they're pumping themselves with air. And then when the body swells, that old exoskeleton splits. So somewhere on this, well, old praying mantis skeleton that we're looking at, it will have split. I'm just going to move it slightly. I don't know where the split will have happened, but it will have, oh, possibly here. Yes, there we go. Hold on, Dobby. It's very fragile. Can you see that there? Right down the middle on the underside, there's been a split. And that's exactly where it will have cracked open. And because that new cuticle has formed, the insect will just shake off its old exoskeleton and continue going about its day. Now, if you are to witness this, it looks utterly bizarre and rather alien-like, but it's completely natural to the insect. And it will not just happen once. Most insects who go through this life cycle will continue to molt and molt and molt. Now, I'm sure you can hear the racket that is happening. We have a very active dam here with all the weavers. Look at that. Sorry, Gwen, can you repeat that? Sorry, Gwen, Davi and I are not quite catching what you're saying. Look at them, look at them all go, they're so busy. an incredible sound. It's very, very loud, and I'm sure you can all hear it through my microphone. But even when you're not listening through a microphone, it's very loud. So I'm not entirely sure, but I think... Demi, you were asking, is it similar to fingernails? No, not at all. Our fingernails continuously grow and it's made from keratin. Our fingernails don't shed. I would be slightly worried if our fingernails started to molt, split open and break off. Oh, I'm having the heebie-jeebies just thinking of that. No, not at all, not remotely. It's an exoskeleton made from chitin. And as I explained, it has to split open and the insect has to form a new one and then climb out of its old shell. So chitin is also a very strong material in the animal kingdom. It's found throughout. It's very prevalent, but it is definitely the insect sort of growth of a new exoskeleton. It's not similar to fingernails. But most arthropods and the phylum arthropoda, the exoskeleton is made from chitin. Whereas our hair and our fingernails is made from keratin which is also another extremely strong material in the animal world. Now, just a quick update. The Incohomas are not on Juma, they're on Simbambili, so that information was, in fact, not correct, I'm afraid. And we're not able to traverse Simbambili right now, but at least we know where they are. Mary, you love listening to these birds. I know. Me too. Something very, very special about weavers. They create magic all in a day's work. 
And they're very petite, small little birds. They're not large. Look what we have over here, Dobby. We have a Woodlands Kingfisher. Do you see that? The Woodlands Kingfishers are actually bigger than the weavers that we're looking at in terms of size. They've got smaller beaks, of course, and yet they're able to create a wonderful structure. It can take them about 12 hours, but of course, if they are going a bit slower or they're maybe paying more attention to competing with the other males, then it can take longer. But 12 hours using your beak to weave a nest like that is just phenomenal. Hello, Mr. or Mrs. Woodlands. Now, we spoke about Tyndall scattering yesterday when we were on the dam camp, talking about the monkeys with regards to the skin. It's exactly how we're getting this blue color on the Woodlands Kingfisher, that bright turquoise. The feathers are actually not that color. It's all due to a unique phenomena, sorry, called Tyndall scattering. The way that the feathers are arranged and the keratin, going back to the keratin, reflects the light, creates that bright turquoise appearance, which is just beautiful. Now we are at Twin Dams. We'll give you a nice view of Twin Dams. I don't think we'll have been able to show you this in a while. But I haven't had much activity at Twin Dams in a very long time. Good morning. Talking of activity, we do actually see water buck now at Twin Dams, which is a new thing. Seems to be females. I haven't seen a male here, but there's quite a few of them. They just wander around the dam all day long. The Dedrix Cuckoo is here somewhere. I'm actually going to try and see if we can locate that bird for you. When on safari, there is nothing better than an evening spent under the stars chatting around a fire with the sounds of the wild all around you. If you sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer, you can build your own memories by joining our guides for regular fireside chats. Subscription payments can be made by PayPal, credit card, and now bank transfer. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. The reason why we see that wildebeest by himself is because he's a male, or a bull, as we typically would call him. And what he does is that he marks and defends an area Essentially, he is looking for the ultimate piece of land or prime property. He needs to have good grazing, he needs to have a water source close by. And not too far away from here, there's a sickle bush thicket that would provide just enough shelter from the wind and the rain. I'm Nikki here at Ambion Ngala in South Africa. I love getting questions from viewers about all the small things within the environment and how it all is integrated with one another. If you want to ask me any questions, please simply register with the Wild Earth website, head across to the Live Safari page and then post your questions there. I'm looking forward to chatting to you on my next Wild Earth Drive. Look at this, the little one is up and about. Certainly hasn't had enough milk at this age. No amount of milk is enough. Oh, corky. Too sweet. Oh, look at this. <laughs> that is stunning. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. There's a grounding earthiness to this place that we feel in our ancestors. It's a place where 
believe it or not, we evolved as a human species, and anyone who's come to Africa will understand that, the, the connectivity that the continent has to the person and to people's souls is next level. I am thoroughly looking forward to taking you on your next adventure when we explore all the small and big things. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. Welcome back everybody. So I'm currently on the, the lookout for any fresh tracks particularly of lions or leopards. Um, we're very shortly going to be crossing, I mean we're about to cross this drainage line that's currently still flowing which is amazing to see and this is a really good place. I'm going to stop in the middle of this and have a quick little look up and down the drainage line to see if we can have, see anything. I mean these drainage lines are perfect for leopards to be moving around in. Background Chagra calling there. So just have a very close look. I'm going to pick up my pair of binoculars and have a look up and down, even to see if I can see any tracks walking. It is quite pretty, and I mean, this river flowing is so amazing. And this river will be flowing straight into the Timbavati, which isn't far away from us, and keeping it filled. So not too much happening on that left hand side. I mean, with this water flowing like this, the bird life is quite amazing. Doesn't seem to be any obvious ones hanging around at the moment. On the right hand side, let's see what's that. That's that little bird there. It's a few little Franklins that were walking around in the, in the riverbed there. Looks like there might be a red back shrike hanging. Let's see if we can see it. Anything up in the top there? I don't see anything. But really pretty and definitely worth a look in this drainage line. I don't see any fresh tracks, unfortunately. I'm actually going to stick on a road that drives parallel to this drainage line and parallel to the riverbed as well, the big riverbed. And as we were saying earlier, like, well, yesterday, in fact, that these areas are really good for leopards. The trees, the size of them, the game density as well is generally highest around the riverbed. And for that reason, the leopards also hang around. Like, oopsie, and that's a big hole. That hole got me yesterday as well. Don't seem to learn my lesson. And with the game density being the highest around the riverbed and having the larger trees, it's definitely perfect. It's perfect for leopard searches. So on this little search, I'll be sure to keep you updated. But for the meantime, I'm going to send you to Lauren with some birds. We got it. Do, 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 do. This is a Didyrex cuckoo. Not an easy bird to get on camera, I must say. A migrant. So we do not see this bird in winter. We do not hear this bird in winter because it's just not here. They arrive for summer and then they leave again once sort of winter really starts to set in. Now they're an intra-African migrant, so they come from various different places in Africa. And this is the male. The male and female look quite different. And the male's the one with a lot of white, that really open, bright white chest. The female sort of, it's more a creamy yellowy color with bars across the chest. And it's maybe not so easy to tell from here, but they're actually bright emerald green. They're a really rich, delicious green color and they have red eyes. I love the call of this cuckoo. You can't mistake it, you can't mistake it for any other bird. And of course, they are brood parasites. A really fascinating phenomena that happens in the animal kingdom. You do not raise your own offspring. You get other birds to do it for you. And when it comes to the nature versus nurture argument, cuckoos are such a good example because they just leave the eggs in a nest of another bird they have a range of host species, the Didyrix cuckoo, and the chicks are raised. Sometimes 
the chicks are raised together with the other, the host bird's chicks. Sometimes the cuckoo's chick will kill them all. It really, really depends on the species. But they still grow up to be a cuckoo. And they still grow up to continue that behavior of brood parasitism. So there you go. That's nature right there, through and through. They've not been taught, never met their parents but yet they still grow up to be a wonderful cuckoo and behave in that way. Donna, you want to know the incubation time? Well, I'm definitely not going to know that off by hand, but I can check for you. I can look at my bird app. incubation period 10 days give or take on average 10 days there you go and I'm trying to see all the species that are actually listed oh my goodness there's many of them they have a real listen So they're not specific in their host bird, the Deidrex cuckoo. And they don't build any nests of their own. They don't waste any energy whatsoever in building nests because that's quite energetically costly. They don't play any parental role. They literally leave that to other birds. There's, although we can think of quite a few examples, there's only about 1% of all birds that actually use brood parasitism as a sort of breeding technique. It's a very successful one at that. And in South Africa, it's your cuckoos, the entire family of honey guides, all of them do that. Indigo birds, why does, and the cuckoo finch. They all use brood parasitism as a breeding technique. And if you think about it, in the natural world, there's absolutely nothing more important than passing on your own genetic material. That's the most important thing. Nancy is a very beautiful bird. It's vastly becoming one of my favorites. My favorite color is green, that's maybe why. Just love that emerald color. So most host species that have received these eggs, they're not actually aware of it. So they've been given the task of raising the cuckoo's chicks, but they don't actually know that they're completely unaware and they've been duped into sort of sacrificing their own time and energy, if you like, to treat these, well, imposters as their own. And that's why we use the word parasitism. It's such a fantastically intelligent technique and it's extremely successful. And the mother cuckoo and the father cuckoo, I guess they don't have to do anything. Nothing whatsoever. You've just got to make sure that you successfully get your eggs in that nest of the host species. How do they do that? Well, how do you persuade a different bird of a completely different family to take on your eggs? Well, you don't, you don't persuade them. It's quite smart how some cuckoos do that. A very unique method. And the female is going to loiter really, really close to that nest, but remain unseen and unheard. She will not call. She's got to remain invisible for the time being. And the male, believe it or not, he will make himself known. I will continue that in just a moment. But for now, we're going to send you guys to Deirdre. Good 
morning. Somebody has finally decided to pop out of the hole. We've been standing here waiting for them for at least half an hour, but uh, the Makala two sentries have uh, stuck their heads out and they're still checking around. So they've literally, not even 10 seconds ago, first time. So as the sun came up, the cloud bank came in and then there was no sun, so there was no meerkats. And now finally the sun is just coming above the clouds. So they've decided that uh, now is the time to come out and check around. It's so good to see them after you have heavy rains the night before. It's just nice to know that they all uh, made it through the night. But once again, having an abundance of food around the burrow and in the summer season, uh, they can afford to come up a little bit later every morning. Uh, there's uh, generally enough food around. Just doing his uh, scan and check around. So if you've got any questions about meerkats, don't hesitate to ask us. Hashtag Wild Earth and put at FC in front of the question if you'd like to know anything about meerkats. That definitely doesn't help live TV when he decides to disappear like that. So as the sun goes up, Nancy says, yay, finally meerkats. Well, so do Morgan and I say, yay, finally meerkats, because uh, we thought they'd be up uh, 20 minutes ago or more. Um, the sun had come up and uh, disappeared. So that's th what, what they've just done now is, is typical for them. They send up the sentry, check around, uh, have a look around what's, if there is anything or any other predator around the burrow system, and then the message must get to the rest of the meerkats below ground because then they do all start popping up. So it's not unusual for a meerkat to pop up for a few minutes, check around, and then go down for a minute or two before uh, coming uh, back up and out but in the in the summer season they don't necessarily need as much time to warm themselves up like they do in the winter they've got um, very thin hair on their front chest area and that's generally what they are exposing to the sun to warm up a little bit but in the summer season they tend to get active a lot faster because of the heat of the day We never know which burrow they're in unless there's uh, nice signs. So in the evening when they come down, they'll... Uh... <laughs> Stuck in bed just asked the question, how tall is a meerkat? Um, probably about 25 centimeters, if they're standing on their back legs, I would say. 20, yeah, about, about that, uh, that height. So they're not weighing uh, very much, no more than a kilo. Um, they're not very heavy, heavy animals. They're quite slight in nature. Maybe there's a problem with the coffee percolator underground this morning because uh, no one else is coming up. So, as I was saying earlier, they don't necessarily all sleep in exactly the same burrow. Sometimes uh, mothers and pups sleep in one burrow and then sentries or males sleep in others. But there's a very good possibility that the burrows, even though they're popping out of different holes, are all interconnected under the ground anyway. These are generally made by ground squirrels. They the ones that tend to start digging the big burrows and then uh, the meerkats move in after a while. And we do know of cohabitation with yellow mongoose. We've got, we've had bat foxes, we've had cape fox also in and around the vicinity of the burrows. Everybody's just using it more for a home at night time. Lisa is asking what is their closest relative. So the meerkats and the mongooses are pretty much uh, in the same group. So meerkats just have a different name, but they're uh, with uh, the mongooses. 
Just trying to see if... Uh, have a look down that little hall, see if there's anyone else. Coming up there, no. You almost want a little, a little bell that you can uh, ring, that they know they must come up. Just, I've got a little, there's a creature here, which I'd like to show you. I don't know if I can come, I'll come in front there for Morgan. I've just picked him up and put him on my finger. Tell me if I'm too close. So this is known as a tuk-tuki. Have you got him there? So either a tuk-tuki or a darkling beetle. Um, he's living a very dangerous life living this close to the meerkat burrow because he would be one of their potential food sources. But an interesting thing with the tuk-tukis is in the arid environments, they actually gain their moisture by going up onto the dunes and letting fog um, develop on the on the top so they stick their backside in the air and you can actually see all these tiny little dots and ridges uh, that breaks up the fog and then it makes it water and it runs down into their mouth and that's actually how they manage to get their moisture but also over time they lost the ability to fly so instead of having I'm going to just tip him a little bit and there's a line straight down the center of the back and that's the wing covers that have actually landed up fusing over time and between the body and that cover, there's actually a cavity that um, when it breathes, that goes into that cavity and actually keeps it nice and humid uh, and allows him a lot better um, moisture availability. So also being darker in color, you'd think in a desert environment that would be, you'd get quite hot, but they're also able to burrow underneath the sand if they get a little bit too hot. The sun's back on the burrow, so maybe the meerkat will come out. But, whoops, I'm going to put him back down on the ground. He better run for cover. So the Tuktoki, um, it's sort of an Afrikaans name, um, and that would be a translation, would be a knock knocky, um, Like, uh, named after apparently a children's game where they used to run and knock on a front door and then run away. But the Tuktokis actually use their abdomen on the ground. The male will knock up and down with his abdomen on the ground, making a certain signal to try and attract a female. Still no meerkats up yet. They're definitely having a morning snooze. So we're gonna stand by for the meerkats. They will come out eventually. We're gonna send you across to Steve who's found something nice on the dam cam. Welcome to the dam cam, everybody. We, we were talking about the dams earlier and this buffalo is walking across the berm. And he is old, he's on his own, he's got a very impressive set of horns. And you see how cautious he is. These guys are always under pressure from lion. Don't go down there, walk across, keep walking across, keep walking across. Now, these are the potentially dangerous fellows that you encounter while on bushwalk, while out and about. And they're very, they're not as vigilant as the herd and uh, they can be rather, rather temperamental. So if you ask any trails guide, he'll tell you that lone buffalo bulls on foot are probably the most tricky. Because he, he allows you to get much closer than a herd would. Not that he allows you to, it's just his vigilance is not really there. And when he does stand up, oh, he's gonna go down. When he does stand up, and you happen to be very close to him, his fight or flight response might be triggered. So you see how he walks around, he knows that he's on his own, so he's got to be vigilant, but these are the individuals that lions will predate on. They're much easier to hunt than a herd, because this buffalo obviously is not easy to hunt, but easier 
and the herd because he's on his own. Tony, I've seen videos of it. I've never seen a buffalo smash a lion live, but I've seen many lions run away from buffalo. They are very nimble lions when they turn and run. They're very nimble and they're very able to get away, but these fellows are very, very strong and very powerful. If they do catch a lion, it is it could be very, very quickly uh, the opposite of predation. Huge competition. Animals like buffalo are the reason lions have formed prides, everybody. It's not common to see a lion able to take on a fully grown buffalo on their own. Uh, in the drought, I believe there was quite a bit of that taking place. Lions were killing buffalo because the buffalo were very low in condition. But at uh, this time of year, seasonality with all this green vegetation, buffalo are in very, very good condition. And uh, that's why we see the shift in predation from large buffalo to that of all the best in zebra. Obviously, impala always feature on the menu, but uh, buffalo herds are very strong and fit at the moment. He's still kind of going through the bushes there. And they like to hang out in thickets in and around watering holes, never too far away from water. So the problem is, is you stumble upon them and there's nowhere to go. Okay, so if Lauren's interested in following up on this buffalo, he's going to be walking down Twin Dams Road in a moment if he comes out of this thicket. This is Twin Dams Road here. Dense, dense vegetation. Now, we've been seeing tracks of a lone bull around for some time. We had him the other day, and he's a very grumpy... And uh, there's, there's leopards around. Uh, we haven't been able to go to Chitra because uh, the lightning the other day has done lots of damage. So we're expecting all sorts of parts to be arriving today. I had tracks of Sabui and her two cubs. It seems like they rejoined yesterday. Uh, going on to Little Gauri from Druma. Um, there's been a male leopard in sort of western parts of Bufusuk that they've been trying to track down yesterday and this morning. Uh, but the tracks have, uh, are very difficult to follow. And uh, the Unkohumas sounded like they were going to come on to Juma this morning from the south. And I haven't heard any further updates in that regard. So the leopards are around, everybody. But um, the vet, look how we've lost that buffalo in the thickets there. The be vegetation is at its peak right now. And herds of buffalo and herds of elephant are obscured from view. So the same goes for our cats. And because the availability of water is so abundant, um, it's very hard to find where they're going. Because if they're not coming to the watering holes to drink, they're getting water from wherever they need to. Very hard to find them. But uh, the tables will turn. Now that the rain has stopped, these cats will have to all move and do territorial markings. And so we should be able to pick up on some signs of them on the road but unfortunately while sitting here at dam cam i am not able to do so we might spot one on the camera this morning who knows you never know what might come down and drink oh, lily you want to know what water plants we have well there's lots of lilies um i can't tell you the species names of these aquatic lilies here Oh, or should I say these, I um, don't even know. So quite a few aquatic floating plants here. There's lots of sedges. All those aquatic plants over there that Jakanas love to hang out on. Water lilies. I don't know the species names. But uh, we've got them in quite a few different uh, pans and watering holes at the moment. And there's duckweed or pondweed floating around. Sedges are very, very commonly found close to and around water. Obviously, there's lots of grass around. Okay, well, we can't see any birds here at the moment, but it sounds like Lauren's found you some.
we are actually on Twin Dams Road and I believe the buffalo may be headed this way. So we're going to try and see if we can keep up with them. We still can't off-road yet, believe it or not. We still keep receiving more and more rain, not in the sort of same volume, but you can see the roads up ahead. Everything is still water. It's amazing. It will slowly drain, it will slowly drain through the soil, but it takes time and we haven't really had that intense, bright sunshine that we all love so much. Okay. We may be having a little bit of trouble with signal. So I will look for the buffalo and we are going to send you guys to Swalu. So Sentry is back out. He's just checking around. The wind has picked up a little bit more, so he is uh, more alert because all the little plants and grasses and leaves are moving. So he's looking for predators. He's looking for African wildcats, jackals, anything uh, that could threaten them uh, and the members of the group. We've only seen him and the other one. Uh, none of the others have popped up yet. But uh, the sun is starting to get... Uh, across a few more of the burrows at the moment. <clears throat> I always find it amazing that they manage on those two little legs and that little tail to prop themselves up for so long. Sometimes in the winter mornings they struggle though. They, as, as they get out of bed they're still a little bit tired and they uh, not often fall over. I got Gracie's asking a question about do they live in a tunnel like system is how I understand it um, yes they do this whole burrow system will be interconnected not necessarily every burrow to every burrow but there'll definitely be groups or collections of these burrows that will be interconnected underneath the, the soil and they're probably going down to more than a meter or so that's generally where in the heat uh, those temperatures are nice and constant, so it's much nicer. A lot of the animals in the Kalahari will actually burrow or live under the ground because um, there is, uh, it's much cooler underground. We've just got a new visitor that's come to pop in at the den. So Morgan's going to move the camera. We're going to leave the, me the meerkat. We're going to show you what the meerkat's looking at now. Sorry, this might be, uh, this is a bit of a handheld story. Uh, but there we go. The giraffe has just arrived uh, at the meerkat den. There's actually been a, a journey or a group that's been moving past, but he's the one that's come the closest to see uh, what we are. He's just using the tree as a bit of a scratching post. And then off he goes on his mission. So he was sort of one of about seven giraffe earlier that uh, have walked past while we've been here. So something like that doesn't bother the meerkats. They, they're alert, they just have a look. Um, it, it's not a predator, so uh, there's no need to stress about the presence of a giraffe or a chemspok or any other animal around. But they will be alert for an, other animals, alarm calling if there was a predator. And they have very good close associations with birds as well. So Kaylin, aged 11, is asking, will meerkats come out when it's raining? Uh, no, they don't like getting wet. Uh, if, uh, if it is raining, they will find wherever they're foraging in the area, they've got lots of different holes, which we would call bolt holes, an area that they can go in quickly if they see a predator. If it starts raining, they'll immediately make it to one of those. Um, and uh, sometimes we've even found that they're overnight in that because the rain doesn't stop. So they choose not to be out in the rain. They also don't like conditions that are very, very windy either. Uh, they will then choose to rather go to bed early. I've, we've been around where about 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, very, very windy or cold in the winter, uh, and they'll just go down early uh, and sleep, at, sleep and then come up uh, the next morning. They really, really are slow starters this morning. It's only just this one that's braved coming out. 
you'll see he just looks around, he looks up, he looks down, he looks left, he looks right, uh, and that's important, that's his job as a sentry, to look and then uh, warn the others if there is anything, or tell them it's okay, they can come out. Maybe he's going across to the other burrow to wake somebody up now. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll stand by. We're still waiting for a few of the others. It's no secret that nature can heal. Some of our Wild Earth viewers are finding solace in the outdoors close to their homes during lockdown. This is how I keep myself busy during lockdown. Beautiful little jumping spot. I love walking in the open spaces near my home. It provides a moment of peace in a crazy world. This is my fire escape with some of the birds I get to see. That's what it's like in New York City during lockdown. Being in nature helps me to cope with the challenges of life and helps me to be humble and grateful. It's magical watching everything turn into a winter wonderland as the snow softly falls. I've been doing lots of walking, dog walking, outside at parks. This is my Ridgeback Drake. Our little slice of paradise is a provincial park called Hopewell Ross. Connecting with nature is critical to stay positive during these tough times. Wild Earth encourages you all to find time to escape to nature. Oh my dear, I do find you most attractive when you're covered in bird lice. Oh Charles, I love it when you peck at my head and clean the bird lice off me. Let me say hello to Barry here. Hello Barry, I'm just going to examine you for some bird lice. Charles, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Oh, all right. I shall look for bird life of myself then. My name is Ross, and I'm a field guard at and beyond Pinda Private Game Reserve. I love getting questions from guests on Wild Earth because I love sharing and learning information about nature with new people, and it also makes me feel like you're all joining me in real life. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, then you need to register on our website. Once registered, go to our live safari page and submit your question below our live feed. The croc is still holding another one there. It's holding from the hindquarters. I would really want the wheel to cross. Is it trying? The croc is holding the tail. It's holding tight. Oh no. Goodness me. Lucky, lucky wildebeest. You have another day to leave. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. As you can see, there's a bunch of elephants just here behind us. I mean, you wouldn't know they're behind us, but they are. And they look to be coming down to the waterhole of Ndlovu Dam which we could probably should rename in Dlovu Lake because it is absolutely monstrous at the moment. It has come up after the rains we just had. And as you can see, it's right here in front of our car. And there there's a leadwood tree uh, with some foam nest frogs in. We usually park next to that tree. And right now, if we parked there, water would probably be up to our shoulders, if not higher. That's how deep this water hole has become. It is absolutely huge. We had, as I mentioned, 30 mils of rain that fell yesterday and all of that fell in the catchment of this dam and as saturated as the soil is, none of it soaked into the ground. It all just flowed straight into this water hole. Here come the elephants. They're about to pass by just over my right shoulder. Hey there, Mama. This is one of the... This is probably the matriarch. You can see she hasn't got milk in her in her memories. She's probably going to lead her family here to drink. Now, we were parked here. We didn't actually know they were coming until a few moments ago. I'm just going to sit still and quiet. How beautiful is that? Well, There's not really much I can do to get out of the way. <laughs> She 
she's probably going to want to lead them to drink somewhere. That's not too deep. Remember, it's a lot more water than normal. I know that our vehicle's a bit close. We can't really see the bottom of them. But if I start the engine now, they might get a fright. And I don't want to bother them. They clearly know that we're here. And they've decided they're quite comfortable with it. Look at that female, the, the largest female at the back there. I don't know if it's possible to see her at the end of her trunk. It's actually quite pink. And that's just a sign of her age. Over time, her skin has been wearing down, getting thinner and thinner. And she's actually losing the pigment on the end of her trunk. Because she wades there. If these elephants do walk into the water, it will give us a really good indication of how deep it is where we would normally be sitting to film. You can also see she's quite old because her ears are very, very floppy. They're losing that rigidity that they would normally have. She's got very sunken temples as well. The matriarchs of elephant herds are almost always the oldest. Trevor, they can. They can certainly survive without their trunk. Uh, they just need to adapt to the way they feed and drink. So if it didn't have a trunk, it will have to literally put the food directly in its mouth. So it will have to find the grasses and the branches that are at mouth level. And if it wanted to drink, it would actually have to wade into a water hole to drink. But they can. I mean, I've seen elephants with pieces of their trunk missing. Significant pieces, sometimes more than half the trunk missing. And they just have to adapt the way they, they behave. But it's certainly possible. There's more elephants coming to the right. Oh, there's a whole massive herd. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reverse back a little bit just to give a bit of space. Now that the elephants are moving on, just so that the rest can come down without being disturbed by us. That should be a little bit better. Is that all right, Gerd? Because you'd see there's another elephant coming up there. And there's a whole other big group of elephants coming to the right of us. This looks like it might be... Oh, no, it's more females. I thought it might be some, some bulls. Those are all females. She's actually got very big tusks for a female. She's heavy with milk. She's busy lactating, which means she's got a youngster. Look at her pushing this other elephant right out the way. And look at them all coming straight down this path. It's amazing. So they are coming to visit the dam for the first time since this rain, and I'm sure they're quite surprised by it. And remember, elephants haven't been here for a long time. A Mary Ann? We actually got sprayed with mud yesterday. Oh, there's a big bull just to the left of us. He is following the females. Look how he sniffs at this female, probably testing if she's in estrus. Luckily, he's not in must. But Marianne, yes, I have been sprayed by water, um, just by accident. But we had an elephant come very close to us yesterday. Wow. Did you hear that grumble? <laughs> you didn't see it. There was an elephant that came right close to the left of our vehicle. She's just doing a bit of a loop around us. Um, we certainly had this young elephant yesterday that sprayed us with mud as it was throwing dirt on itself. So it was very interesting. It doesn't happen often though. We try not to be that close to the elephants. We'd like to give us a little bit of space to react if there's a reason to react. Very important. So elephants weren't allowed or they were fenced out uh, of Pride Lands up until about two and a half to three years ago. So it means that these elephants have never seen this water hole this full. Oh, Nathan, welcome to the show. Uh, that's a good question. How much does an elephant need to eat? I think that was the question. Um, well, I mean, the, it depends on the size of the elephant. Some elephants will eat less than others. 
But I think a big, very big elephant, like mm, the elephant that's the big bull that we saw that came in just now, Nathan, that bull might eat 150 kilograms. Anywhere between 150 to 300 kilograms of food every single day, especially now in the in the summer when the grass is green and lovely. He'll be eating quite a lot, so that's a lot. Nathan, that's twice my weight. Twice my weight if it's 150 kilograms. That's, that's a lot of food. Remember, they're on the move all the time, so they always need to be eating. Because of all the size of their body, they need a lot of energy. There's a bit of trumpeting there. Look how the elephants have all stopped for a moment. One of the youngsters was being bothered by its sibling, so they all trumpeted and there was a bit of a, of a complaint and they all stopped for a moment just to listen if there was any danger, but they seem to be moving on again now. You can see how that bull towers over the rest of these elephants. He's really, really massive, and that's why the elephants sometimes get quite agitated when big bulls like that are interested in them. Because they can easily hurt the youngsters if by accident or even on purpose if the youngsters get in the way and they're in must. They'll come charging through, chasing off uh, the youngsters to, in order to get to the females, and that causes a lot of distress to a group. Now all the elephants taking the easier route along the top of the dam wall in order to get to the other side of the dam. Normally they would just walk through, but the water is so deep now I think that even some of those females would be completely submerged if they tried to walk through this water hole. That's really spectacular. It's good to have the elephants back again. And I wonder what they think about this water hole. Is it too deep now? I wonder if they'll still do a lot of swimming. We saw elephants swimming a few days ago, but not since the big rains that filled this thing up completely. So I wonder if now it might be a bit too deep for them to go right into the middle. More rumblings, more communication. So let's see what this bull does. Is he going to follow this herd or is he going to stay here and keep drinking? Well, what we're going to do is sit around here and watch these elephants and see what they do. And in the meantime, I think Lauren's got a giraffe. A beautiful male giraffe. Now, we spotted one buffalo. I don't actually know how many buffaloes Steve managed to see on the dam cam, but it didn't seem to enjoy our presence and it dashed into the Mowati. But we did find one. Maybe Gwen can let me know how many buffalo Steve had on the dam cam. Okay, it was only one. So that must have been the individual, and it dashed deep into the thicket of the Mowati. So I don't think we'll be able to find that buffalo again, but we have managed to spot you a giraffe. Mmm, <laughs> a very dark one. Not all the species have the same pattern of the thermal windows or the thermal patches. They're all very different. If you actually Google it, I think you'll be very surprised. You get the southern giraffe, the Maasai giraffe, the reticulated, and the northern, the four confirmed species now. And they all have very, very different designs, if you like. And it's really, really beautiful to see how different they all look. There's some scars. I think this is an older boy. That's normally how you tell. When they're quite heavily scarred like that. He's been through the wars. <laughs> oh, look at that. Oh, down his legs. And this is an older bull.
He looks quite strong. Tandy? Yes, he does look very strong. They are really powerful animals. They're just not recognized for being so, if that makes sense. I mean, the males can weigh up to 1,400 kilograms. Wow. So not only do they have that height advantage, they also have incredible body mass behind them. So they're really, really powerful. One kick from a giraffe if you're a predator like a lion, and it could really be game over. There's some awful videos on YouTube where you see lions attempting to take down a giraffe and it just doesn't work in their favor. They're very strong. And the sort of, not only do they have a unique skeleton, they're also gonna have unique muscle structures to support that unique skeleton. And the sort of, oh dear, he's gonna walk right behind the car. Okay, we're not gonna be able to give you any views of the giraffe for now, but let's go across to Deirdre and her meerkats. we figured out what took so long. It's trying to get the kids out of bed. There's a little four, four of the four month olds uh, that were obviously the ones struggling. Standing there just uh, enjoying that sun. I haven't started to look to forage yet. Everyone's still uh, on alert, but uh, <laughs> they're still so small, there we go, he nearly fell over, <laughs> they're still so small that they don't quite have uh, the full strength to stand for long lengths of time uh, on their legs and their tail, so often they just uh, sit down like they're doing uh, there, they're still getting the sun on their body, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, a lot harder to stand up uh, straight like the one in the background. So they'll start doing this, a couple of them that'll start doing now some burrow maintenance, just doing some cleaning up for the morning while they look around, while they enjoy the sun. Oh, there's one, one adventurer, he's uh, heading off on his own. We can show you, uh, he's the first one uh, to go out uh, exploring. Oh, did he just got a scorpion? I don't know quite what he got, but that's uh, the first uh, meerkat kill for the morning. He's definitely, uh, so the the four month olds, the, the youngsters would, uh, they're capable enough now of uh, scratching and finding food for themselves. Once they're sort of a, about two weeks old, they start going to forage for at least about a month that they forage with uh, the adults and they almost stick with one adult that helps feed them uh, and they beg for food and then they figure it out uh, for themselves here. Yeah? And uh, now they're old enough to stop begging for food so the adults just eat whatever they find for themselves. I hope that beetle's fine. <laughs> he better have legged it out of here, otherwise uh, he may well be breakfast. That was a good. That was a good meal. It, it looked like he he reacted pretty quickly, and it was quite a big meal. I would say it's probably a scorpion, but they're also eating those. Um, Armoured ground crickets. Alicia's asking how many meerkats can be in one burrow? Well, it depends on the success of the actual meerkat group. Uh, we've got a group here that we know of that's 23 individuals. Uh, and then we've also got a group that at one stage, uh, because of predators and things like jackal, snake, African wildcat, uh, even honey badger, their numbers went right down to three. So uh, that was a, a little bit of a challenge for them, but the the higher the number, the better for them because then there's there's enough the sentry duty or the guard duty gets spread out amongst the generally the sub adult males, but everybody takes their turn uh, and it allows the others time to forage. 
they, they have they run into difficulties once the meerkat group starts getting too much smaller because then they need to find enough food for themselves but they can't always be uh, on sentry duty divided by say for example if there were five of them so then they tend to um, get a little bit uh, lax on their duty uh, and they are more vulnerable to the predators. Oh, they're just sitting so nicely. But also meerkat groups will be, they can have anywhere up to about six pups at a time. Jelly says they've got a good life. I absolutely agree with you, but they've also got a tough life. It's not so easy. You know, every day you've got to be looking up, looking around, watching out for predators. So it can be uh, quite challenging uh, to do that. But uh, summer seasons are definitely easier for the meerkats when there's a lot more food and insect uh, activity. There's a lot more available uh, and they don't have to cover vast distances in order to forage to find enough food. So they tend to stay around in this burrow system for a while. Uh, once they've gone out foraging and they start feeling like they're exhausting their food supply close to this burrow system, they'll move to another burrow system and then do the same uh, in that area and they're typically having sort of a two, two to three square kilometer territory. But sometimes the groups, if it's a larger group, they need more foraging areas and if it's a smaller group then they can afford to have a slightly smaller foraging area. So while they're looking around, uh, warming themselves up, we're going to send you across to Lauren, who's got a tiny insect for you. One of my favorite insects, actually, the net-winged beetle. They are everywhere right now, absolutely everywhere. You cannot mistake them you, with that sort of aposematic coloration, the orange contrasting against the black. A big warning. Don't eat me, guys. It's not worth it. And look who we have here. Hello. It's been a while since I've seen a dwarf mongoose. Have you just woken up? I think you have. Dwarf mongoose are notorious for not waking up until the sun is fully up. The birds are fully in swing of their dawn chorus and it's nice and bright and warm. <laughs> they don't wake up when the sun just starts to come up. No, 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 no. They wait until the sun is fully up. Mm, there's another one. They're all starting to come. There must be a term. Oh, there's three. There must be a termite mime nearby, but I can't actually see it. I don't know which mime they're coming from. <laughs> and yes, they are. I mean, dwarf mongoose definitely does give the indication of being small, but they are the smallest. Apparently, there are banded mongoose or a group of banded mongoose on weaver's nest, and I keep looking for them, and I keep looking for them. I used to see bandied a lot in the Maasai Mara, but it's not so common for here in Juma. I've not found them yet, but I'm not going to give up. But the dwarfies are probably the most common we get out here, and definitely the smallest, the low felt smallest little carnivore. We do get the white-tailed, but they're nocturnal, so you'll only really get lucky with them once it gets dark. And we get the slenders. We see many slenders out here. And what's so unfortunate is it's just such a struggle to get them on camera. We've had um, Miller's once. Miller's once. Oh, Myers once. Was that not with James? It was. Yes. Davi is reminding me. I remember that. I think I was the other feed. And... Yes, James came across a Mayors, I think, or is it Myers? Let me just check the... I think it's Miller's. Hmm. 
So we get a lot of different species out here. But the dwarfies are definitely the more common ones. Did you catch that name, Davi? It was Sona. We think Sona. I hope I'm correct there. Dwarf mongoose, believe it or not, are incredible little carnivores. They look so sweet, but in actual fact, they've got extremely sharp claws and huge teeth. And that's not a dwarf mongoose, is it? Wally. It's a squirrely. It's not Wally. I hope it's not Wally. I hope Wally has not followed us on drive. That'll be a little bit worrying. <laughs> Wally is a squirrel, a tree squirrel that has, uh, I don't know just appeared into our life and it's not going anywhere but yes dwarf mongoose will eat small snakes absolutely not big snakes but they will go for small snakes and they're sort of more common food source in their diet is insects but a huge range of insects from centipedes ugh, to large beetles scorpions so we showed you the exoskeleton of uh, what I think was a praying mantis this morning. So when the exoskeleton is sort of really, really rigid, it's going to be difficult to break through that. And yet the dwarf mongoose is able to get right through that exoskeleton of these insects and eat the delicious insides, I guess. They will also go for eggs, bird eggs, reptilian eggs they've got a very very broad diet but if it's a small snake they absolutely will go for it including other reptiles as well geckos lizards they're quite the hunters possibly not this nightwing beetle though one i don't think they taste good and two it's very very small that's not going to be enough to sustain the very very busy dwarf mongoose We're going to bumble back to quarantine, see if anything exciting is happening there. We're going to send you across to Ingala with an eagle. Welcome back, everybody. Now, I'm still kind of driving along the, the course of the riverbed here, looking to see if we can find anything in this thick vegetation. And we've come across this dead fig tree and in the top right of the dead fig tree is I mean have a look at that quite a big dead tree in fact look how small that bird of prey looks in the top right of it it's quite an amazing shot actually so even just the size of that bird once zoomed out like that will kind of give it what the species is away it's one of our smallest eagles around in fact the smallest eagle that we find around here and it's a Warburg's eagle. And as we zoom in a little bit more, you will, I mean, the size was something that you kind of looked out for. The color, I mean, the color is not an amazing thing to kind of look out when IDing these Warburg's eagles, simply because their colors can vary so incredibly. And you see, as it's turning its head like that, look at the back of its head. You see that little feather, that little fluff of feather that's sticking out there. Almost like a little Johnny Bravo at the back of its head. That's a, a, a distinguishing feature for this bird, this Warburg's eagle. Being so small, that little feature, quite brown in colour. And during the summertime, quite a popular bird to see around. Um, also one of our migrants, one of our first to arrive and leaves probably between March and April or so. But quite an incredible bird. I mean, they come down to South Africa to breed. We see them quite frequently. Let's, uh, it was just a dove was going to try and chase it away and they've got an incredibly wide species that they hunt and feed on lots of reptiles small mammals snakes lizards all sorts of things birds and you'll see they're very territorial as well they'll come back to the same kind of area year in and year out they're monogamous as well so they'll have the same partner pretty much for life and they'll come back They'll build a nest, often just below the canopy of a tree, um, a stick platform nest as well. And they'll come year after year 
to the same nest. Occasionally they'll have several nests in the same territory and they'll come back to the same nest every year. The same male, the same female lay generally one egg or so. It's very rarely two eggs, but generally one. And they'll do that for almost up to 30 years. They will come and breed in the same area and they'll have territorial disputes um, with other Warburg's eagles and that involves them in the air, mid air kind of tangling with each other and doing these kind of cartwheels in the air, lots of fighting. But when they do leave South Africa, they kind of, in, they're what we call intra-African migrants. They move to the rest of Africa and they'll kind of follow the season and follow food. And during the winter time, you won't see them here. So I'm gonna keep going along the road here. Let's see what else we can find. It's been a morning for birds, maybe some other interesting birds along the way. I'm gonna let this warbird continue hunting from where it is while I continue on my search for some cats. Do you dream of traveling to a far-flung wilderness location where life continues as normal? A place where you can escape to nature and breathe. If you become a wild earth explorer, then this could soon become a reality. Subscribe today and stand a chance to win regular travel prizes. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. We stopped as the dusk was settling and there was a zebra mare underneath the bush. She was lying down, we didn't really know what was happening and then we saw it. Everybody, there's a zebra giving birth there. There's a zebra giving birth. This is a zebra giving birth. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, you clever mare. Well done. It's born, everyone. It's born and it's alive and it looks fine. This was, of course, an unusual sighting. Normally, herbivores like impala and wildebeest and zebra will give birth during the middle of the day. This is when their predators like lions and hyenas are fast asleep. Uh, but as this little foal took its first steps, the dying embers of the day had just gone over the western horizon and it was just the time that the hyenas and lions were starting to get active and go out foraging. This is why we didn't light up the sighting of course, it may have compromised the zebra's eyes and at the same time attracted those hyenas and lions to the activity. My name is Taylor McCurdy and I work for Eco Training. I love hearing from all of the viewers. However, I particularly enjoy those of you who have been watching for a few years. Your questions are just so advanced and they really get me thinking. If you'd like to ask a question on Wild Earth, you need to register on our website. Once you've done that, head to the live safari page and submit your questions below the live feed. Hello, Mama. Just checking us out, everybody. There's no aggression here. Very relaxed. A herd of elephants moving around your car like that. It's truly, truly magical. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. So it's one herd after the next, after the next, coming down here to Ndlovo Dam. This is at least the third group of elephants that have come down here, and it's actually incredible. This one is mostly youngsters that have come down. You can see they're starting to also make their way across to the other side of the dam, or well, most of them are actually in the water drinking right now, but a few of them starting to make their way across. And you can see now just how deep it is right there, close to that tree. I'd like them to go a little bit further forward so we can really see just how deep it is right next to that leadwood over there. See more elephants just at the other side of the dam. So we know elephants can communicate over huge distances. So clearly the first elephant group came, announced that the water was good and full and lovely, and then the next herd came and confirmed that in the next herd. And I'm sure there'll be more elephants that come down. Lots of communication happening, lots of rumbles and grumbles. 
So what's happening over there? These two were having a big fight earlier and actually the small one got pushed into the water and caused a, a big scene through a little bit of a tantrum. You can see how wet it is. It, it was right in the water. The big one had pushed it right in. Leopard lover, I'm not sure that I understood the question. Did you ask what I've learned about the bush from elephants? If I understand that question correctly. Maybe if I can get that question again. Well, so I did understand it correctly. You know, elephants are very stoic animals. They continue on with life. If they find water, it's great. If they don't find water, they just keep moving until they find water. They're patient, caring mothers, protective. I think it just teaches you a lot about maturity and about just keeping on going and moving forward, I suppose. It's pretty incredible. That's what it's taught me personally. What it's taught me about the bush, uh, the bush surprises you every single day. I mean, this water surprised us when it arrived. We weren't expecting it. But yeah, we just keep on going, I suppose. This one here is having to engage for way four in order to get up that little... Oh, it's embarrassing that you, got, that you slipped there. That's okay. We all slip sometimes. This one hasn't learned yet about patience. It's a youngster. It's a young male as well, so makes it even more short-tempered. Young males always think they can do anything. Darn the consequences. Keep staring back at us just to make sure we're not following. You can see now spread out all along this dam wall, there's elephants there drinking, there's a few more walking along. Further left, there's more and more elephants really spectacular. We we're actually wondering if this is why the lions hadn't been coming to Ndlovu Dam recently that much because there's just so much elephant activity always at this dam. It makes it quite tricky for the lions, especially if they've got youngsters, to move around without coming into some sort of a conflict. incredible considering there's probably around about 30 elephants at the water hole and around the water hole right now that they can be very quiet apart from a few grumblings here and there a few splashes there's really not much sound you really can hardly tell that there are that many massive animals I think I can hear even more coming potentially off to our right, so it could get even more exciting. Can elephants taste sweet, bitter and sour tastes? I'm almost certain that they can in fact differentiate flavors because I mean, they love marula fruits. I mean, they literally seek them out in this time of year now when marulas are fruiting heavily and the fruits are falling on the ground, they will literally avoid, some of the bulls anyway, don't seem to be eating anything else other than rulers. They must eat other things as well, but I'm trying to see if there's any elephant dung close to us right now. I know we have seen a lot of elephant dung, but I can't see any that shows the ruler fruits. But yeah, they love ruler fruits and citrus. There's lots of stories of elephants coming right up to people's um, vehicles when they're camping in places like Botswana where there are no fences and they literally put their trunks in the car to reach and grab bags of oranges because they absolutely love citrus. So I'm sure that they can taste sweet and sour. Sometimes you see an elephant put something in its mouth, chew it a little bit and then just spit it out. Does not like it. Interestingly, there's this young bull now just approaching us for no reason whatsoever. But all the other elephants are far away. And this one here is just coming back to investigate us. What are you up to? See what I mean about young, 
young bulls just think that they own the whole place. Where are you going? Everyone else went the opposite way. He's a rebel, that's what he is. Just making a lot of noise, grumbling and rumbling. You can hear it wading through the, the overflow water. Surrounded by all the wild fox gloves, towering above this elephant. It's beautiful this time of year. Not really sure what's happening, to be honest. I know that this elephant can communicate over a huge distance, but why it would be leaving its herd and going in the opposite direction is beyond me. It's not so old. There's no reason for it to be leaving. The mother wouldn't be chasing it at this age yet. It's probably only about six or seven years old, maybe even less. Maybe it's found a patch of sweet grass. I mean, it is rumbling all the time, so it's communicating. Maybe it's just had an argument. A falling out with one of its siblings, and so it's just leaving the water hole to give it a bit of a break. It's always good to avoid conflict, after all. Give itself time to cool off. Well, we are probably going to maybe make a move from here in the next few minutes if no more elephants arrive. And in the meantime, whilst we make that decision, we'll send you over to Steve with a heron at a water hole. Welcome back to the dam cam, everybody, where we've got a very intent heron Beautiful concentration and awareness. Probably the most common of the herons that we will find around here. See those enormous feet for allowing them to move in a very inundated, floody waters, muddy waters. I'm not talking about the band, everybody. It's like snowshoes. You need large feet to distribute the weight of the body. And you can see the intention on the face. So the intention is very clear from this fellow. He's obviously saw something moving in the pan. It could be a frog, most likely a frog. I don't think there's many fish. And if it stays relatively still, that neck will start to arch. And it's able to thrust that very powerful beak, very accurate beak forward pinpoint location this is where patience pays off it only needs a few fish a day everybody so it's got all the patience in the world you know in the middle of your hunt you suddenly get a bit of a bum itch it's nothing quite like it, is there? You just gotta scratch that spot. What spot? Yes, that spot. Ascari wants to know why do some birds hop and some walk? Well, Ascari, it's got a lot to do with the leg structure, the foot structure. Um, some birds are designed to spend a lot more time on the ground and so walking, whereby the foot goes one left, one right, forward is a very efficient way of moving. Um, and then the birds that we see that hop, uh, they're not necessarily designed for walking around the ground. They are perching birds. 
and so they just probably don't have the length of leg for the proper walking stride that you find some birds able to do but some birds that can walk can also hop like the hornbill uh, especially when they're landing or when they're about to take off especially landing actually they will hop as they land because it's a way of sort of landing both the wheels on the ground at the same time but generally the birds that hop are all our very small little finch like birds seed eating birds and it's quite efficient for them to just hop around they don't have very long legs so for them to be able to design the ability to walk left foot right foot probably evolutionary it just didn't happen but some birds such as your thrushes they run around on the floor and that is often the differentiating characteristic between a thrush and a ground robin or a scrub robin or a robin chat in that the robin chats and robins hop around on the floor in the undergrowth whereas the thrushes actually run. So I think it's got a lot to do with ground terrestrial ability versus tree ability that is my two cents anyway evolutionary oh ruffle the feathers it's a lovely little shake got all the time in the world everybody this heron but look at those feet amazing aren't they now the male is just slightly bigger than the female And this just wants to you to see its reflection now. Mm. Okay, well our heron is going to meander around the watering hole looking for something to snack on. While well, we send you over to Lauren who's got something for you. I think we need to start calling that heron the hungry heron. I think it's the same one. It's very hungry. Hmm, now I'm hungry. Now we are looking at an elegant grasshopper. It's definitely a grasshopper and not a cicada, but I thought I would share something very fascinating with you about cicadas. Sometimes grasshoppers are called locusts and locusts are called cicadas and cicadas are called locusts. There are differences, but there's something called swarmageddon. Don't you just love that? Even Davi chuckled there. Not Armageddon, Swarmageddon. And it refers to a vast number of cicadas, around 3 million, emerging from underground in North America. And they are, in fact, called the 17-year cicadas. <laughs> it's not the best name I've ever heard, but, you know, we'll work with it. And they're sap-sucking insects. So what happens is they live underground and they completely forego any sort of life or any outdoor above ground life for 16 years 16 years in the uk that's the age you start driving that's a long time and these cicadas live completely underground in the dark depth underneath the trees they do feed they feed on a sap it's almost like a root sap cocktail if you like through their proboscis so they don't have mandibles they're not chewing anything just like a butterfly they're drinking the sap through their proboscis and then on year 17 well they emerge in such vast numbers it's said to be very very creepy shall we say it's quiet they're wingless they don't fly but they all sort of climb out from the tree on year number 17. so i guess if you've spent 17 years underground being very quiet you're going to want to make up for that i guess and they sing and they sing at such an intense high frequency that the noise is said to be almost deafening and can you believe it some people's hearing has actually been severely affected by this that they've suffered from slight hearing loss there's also lots of stories from north america i don't quite know where that they have to cancel things like weddings in large events because the cicadas have emerged and they're so loud that it's not possible to hold that event anymore. You wouldn't be able to hear one another. The sound can actually be as high as 100 decibels. 
So weddings have been cancelled, gatherings, and that's exactly why they call it the Swarmageddon of the 17-year cicada. Unbelievable. And considering the fact that they spend a good 16 years underground, that's, I guess that's like 99% of their life, or 99.5% of their life. Their actual life as a cicada adult is over within three to four weeks. So you've waited 16 years to then finally emerge on year number 17, and it's over in four weeks. And that's the reason they're singing so fast and so furiously. They've emerged, they're here, they're alive, and they need to mate. There would no point in being an adult insect if you're not mating. And that's why they start to sing their songs. And that will lead to mating, which will lead to eggs, the new generations. And basically, once the eggs are laid, the nymphs will hatch. The juvenile cicadas are called nymphs. And once they hatch, they just crawl along the branch that they were born in. They're born in the tree. They drop. They just completely drop out of the tree and they dig their way down into darkness. And 17 years later, they'll come back out again. Can you believe that? Can you believe that, Davi? That's my game drive video. I'll just turn that down. So we are not looking at a cicada, but I thought I would just share that with you because I thought it was really fascinating. <laughs> Salamander? No, I don't. And of course, for different swarms, for different colonies, it's going to have a different emergence date. So it's not going to be the same year across the board. And apparently it's a huge problem, just at least in terms of sound. So I don't know when that's going to happen, but I will try and find out for it. I will try and find out for you. They're said to be one of the longest living insects. And there's also a 13 year cicada. I'm sure I don't need to explain that one to you. I'm guessing it's very, very similar. And they have sort of different broods with different timings all across the US. So it's going to be very unlucky if you plan your wedding day on that same sort of time that after 17 years these cicadas emerge. And their genus name, the genus, sorry, is Magis Cicada. Magic. Magi cicada, I think that's how you pronounce it. So they're very peculiar indeed. And one of the main questions in science is how do the insects know when it's been 17 years? I can't, I struggle to remember what day of the week it is. Luckily, we have an iPhone, but the cicadas do not have an iPhone that I know of. So how on earth do these creatures know? Oh, it's been 17 years now, everyone. It's time to emerge. And it's astonishing. There's really lots of different sort of theories, basically, as to why they do this. And the sort of answer to the why is for survival, of course. They say that this type of behavior, this life cycle, reduces the chance of being eaten. What do I mean by that? Well, cicadas are very large and rich in all sorts of protein and delicious fatty acids that they are very sought after by larger insects, birds, mammals, lizards. So just very similar to impalas, when impalas drop their lambs, as we call this flooding the market. It's a very similar sort of strategy, if you like, and they, they flood the market. And this means that a larger proportion of the cicadas are able to survive. Then they'll mate, then they'll lay eggs. So they disappear, and then all of a sudden, because that time interval is so, so long that it's very unlikely that any predator will be able to adapt to it. Predator and prey are always in a constant evolutionary arms race. It never stops. It's never static. So because they just emerge once in every 17 years, it's very unlikely that the predators will be able... Sorry about that, everybody, but we still have a very hungry heron here, as Lauren calls him, or her. It's very hard to say, as I said, the size is 
which is slightly different between male and female, so without seeing the two together. I wonder if you recall the times with the black-headed herons in the Mara, I mean, when they were catching the rats. Quite something to behold. Quite a large rodent-like animal on the floor being swallowed whole by a bird like this. It's generally what separates the two. Herons are normally found here around these watering holes in the water as the her black-headed herons will range far and wide into grasslands. Not impossible to find them near water. But the black eyebrow and those plumes on the back of the head there will um, separate the two. Justine, do all parents hunt the same way? Not sure I understand the question. All herons hunt the same way. Well, all herons of the same species hunt the same way and most herons hunt very similarly. I wouldn't say there's much distinction in the difference. The very sharp beak and long powerful neck is designed for fast quick stabbing motions. A very still statuette-like embodiment allows them to remain undetected from their predator, from their prey, for the most part. Obviously it is an arms race where the predator gets good so the prey improves on their ability to remain undetected, but this fellow is just gorging itself now. I would say it's probably on small tadpoles. Could be insects as well. Can't really tell from here. too close in the zoom to lose a little bit of its distinction. Imagine you could apply just a moment of that focus to your day. Jane, I don't know actually. A pretty large bird. I'd say they probably live up to about 10 years of age, but I don't know. I don't know how old or how long herons live for naturally in the wild. I can try to find out though. Okay, well, we're going to stay here with the heron, try and find out how old. I think it says it's about five years. And uh, maybe Lauren will find you something with her grasshopper. Sorry about earlier. I do not know what happened. We did not move. So I don't quite know where I got to, but basically the why is that most likely... The swarmageddon will never be in sync with the predator's life cycle and it reduces the chance of being eaten. So it's a survival trait. But the how, if you like, how on earth does a cicada know it's been 17 years? I even forget what age I am sometimes. Honestly, I still think I'm 21. And it's said to do with soil temperature. So when they're at depth, they're below the surface and amongst the roots of trees. And when the temperature has remained above 18 degrees Celsius for four days, for the 17th time, the cicada's internal alarm clock goes off simultaneously across the board. Oh, hey guys, right, that's 18 degrees Celsius for four days now. For the 17th time in a row, it is time to emerge. <laughs> And they don't understand how the countdown happens, but it's something to do with a bio uh, environmental cue, which is a temperature, triggering a biological cue to then proceed to emerge from underground. And I think that is just absolutely incredible. They also thought it was maybe to do with counting, 
the sort of number of times the trees blossom. But again, I think that was pretty much debunked. So as I mentioned in the beginning, a lot of people confuse cicadas with crickets and grasshoppers. And basically, when we say bugs, that's actually sometimes incorrect. Not all insects are bugs. Bugs is a term that we just use loosely. But you get the order Hemiptera, and that's the order of insects. That's the true bugs. They're classified as true bugs. And cicadas are true bugs. Whereas crickets and grasshoppers are, they belong to Orthoptera. I think that's how you pronounce it. And they are not classified as true bugs. So most of these insects that I've just mentioned make a noise, but they do it in different ways. They don't produce sound in the same way, and they do it at different times. So generally, during the sort of middle of the day in the hot sun, when you hear that sound begin, it's normally the cicada that's making that sound. But right now, we are looking at a grasshopper. I just thought that was so fascinating when I read about that, an insect that waits 17 years before coming out from under the ground. Unbelievable. Although scientists did manipulate the trees and they got them to blossom twice in one year and this did actually mean that the 17-year cicadas emerged a year early, which means they are now 16-year cicadas. <laughs> so possibly, possibly the blossoming of trees has got something to do with it. But either way, the environmental cues trigger biological cues. It could be a hormonal cue and that triggers a response from the insect immediately. It's time to emerge. So we are going to let this little grasshopper be for now and see what else we can find around quarantine. How insane is that animal? This is out of this world. Fantastic. Good, Mama. Wow, what a way to start off. It's just such an incredible privilege to be out here. It just keeps on delivering. There you go, there you go. Heart is pumping right now. Three, two, one. You are alive, you are alive. Look at this, everybody. We've got a live kill. The clock's holding the tail. It's holding tight. Lucky wildebeest. There's nowhere to go. This is a disaster in the making. This is the first leucistic zebra I have ever seen in my life. Oh, here comes a lion. Run, little guy. Go on. Something that I have never seen before in my entire life that you are now watching live. My heart is in my mouth, everybody. Look at this, it's gonna make it. It's going, it's going. This is just too magical. Hi, little guys. That's great, isn't it? Is it just pretended to be dead? That is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Look at that. Scuba Steve has got a friend. You've got a friend in me. Couldn't be a better morning. This is just too special. Oh my goodness, we've got a turtle. How epic is this fact that we come into you live on the Joby River? It's the most incredible feeling to be here. This is live and we're in Rwanda. This is a very, very different adventure, charged with emotion. <gasps> Look at that little zebra about to be born. There's the head. Oh, you clever mare. Well done. I did not think I would ever face my fears like this. So here we have a little family of ground squirrels. We actually had another burrow system where sometimes the horse and meerkats like to live uh, and this group of squirrels uh, also lives here at the same, same burrow system but the horses have they've moved to another 
another den at the moment. But it's nice to see the little uh, squirrels. They're also quite close to home at this stage, just foraging around close to the area. There are a couple of youngsters in there. So the little, uh, you can see they're much smaller in size and still uh, figuring out how to be a squirrel. So also food availability for them at the moment, lots of it. So they're eating a lot of the grass shoots uh, and the, the roots, the, the flowers or the inflorescence of the grasses. They're enjoying those. You see they've got quite a prominent sort of stripe down the side of the body. And then also, uh, they do also enjoy uh, sunning a little bit in the morning, but not uh, not as much as the meerkats. Uh, and they all use their tail. They fluff their tail out and they cover their back if it's going to be very, very hot. I think mum wants to do some grooming. They want to happen some grooming and nobody's interested. So if you've got any questions, don't forget to send us at hashtag wild earth at FC and uh, we'll uh, try and answer your questions. Hey. Haley is asking if we've got tree squirrels in Swalu, if I understood the question correctly. Flying squirrels, no, but tree squirrels also not. Um, so only the Cape ground squirrel uh, in Swalu. Uh, South Africa doesn't have any flying squirrels. Uh, the only other squirrel uh, that you would possibly see would be the squirrels at Juma and uh, that would be the tree squirrel and maybe luckily the Tonga squirrel I think from Pinda. There's one of the beautiful red tailed if I'm not mistaken. But no flying squirrels in in Southern Africa. So they very similar to the meerkats in nature in that they also stand up on their back legs and also look around. They would be um, looking for exactly the same predators. So predators that would eat meerkat would also just as easily eat squirrels. Uh, and that would be jackal, some of the aerial birds, some of the eagles like uh, martial eagle and uh, other large raptors. And even uh, they are vulnerable, especially if they got youngsters in a burrow system uh, to snakes as well. So the Cape Cobras uh, are probably their biggest enemy. Between the Cape Cobras and the Puff Adders, probably the biggest enemy for squirrels and meerkats as far as the snakes go. Was he cleaning his toes? Giving himself a manicure? Danae is asking the question, how many different vocalizations do they have? Ooh, I, don't, I don't know off the top of my head an exact number, but they will have a lot of different ones for different things. So uh, they'll have a different uh, alarm for an aerial predator, a different alarm for a ground predator, and then also different vocalizations for communication amongst them. So I'm sure uh, if we Googled it, we'd find an exact... Uh, an exact number of what the researchers have uh, figured out. But yeah, there will be a lot of different uh, vocalizations and that goes with, with many animals. They'll have uh, lots of different ones that mean different things. Uh, the other animal that has quite a lot would be the vervet monkeys and the, and the baboons. They often have different uh, alarm calls for different, uh, different species. So we actually found, I'm gonna put it here for, for Morgan. On the, on the vehicle we found uh, on the road close by we found it was lying like that um, which if we have a look somebody had a nice snack uh, on this melon so this is uh, generally a round round melon that can get quite big probably about that size um, and has lots of seeds inside I'm sure one of the guides has cut one open for you but we only found this little piece um, so a really nice uh, spotty uh, coloration on the outside it isn't quite ripe yet they're normally more ripe when they're yellow in color but uh, whichever animal 
uh, found that probably something like a squirrel or even a baboon has managed to uh, eat all the seeds out of that and really enjoy it. The tama melon is also like, it's just an awesome moisture package. If any animal going into the dry season is looking for uh, some extra moisture and they can find a tama melon, they can uh, get that from, from this melon. So, and they'll have like a, they live as a creeper on the ground. Pretty, pretty little melon. No, you still uh, turned around for you. It's actually got scratch marks on it, so that would maybe be the nails of the squirrel. Jamie says uh, they've scraped it so clean. Yep, definitely. I mean, it's a, it's an amazing uh, food source for them. So, yeah, you definitely don't want to leave. Uh, anything behind. If it was a bigger animal, something like a porcupine, I would actually probably think that they'd maybe even eat the skin as well. But uh, I, yeah, I don't know what a melon tastes like, um, this particular melon, so maybe uh, the skin is not as nice tasting as the rest of it, but I think definitely a porcupine would, uh, would eat them. Sometimes you're also finding, I've seen large numbers of armored ground crickets. Maybe I can convince this one that he wants to be my friend. Um, Nope. <laughs> no, and they're just everywhere at the moment. Maybe we can find one for you, uh, Morgan, on the camera. Here's one here, um, down there. But they are everywhere at the moment, these almond ground crickets. This one's probably easier, actually. Can you see him there? Oh, he's, <laughs> he's just stuck his antennae out to touch my finger. Uh, and see if I'm a threat. So if you get too close to them, they make like a funny little, uh, a funny sound to say, hey, back off, don't eat me. Um, and funny enough, the, the meerkats, they, they choose, some of them decide that they want to eat them and other meerkats leave them alone. So when they approach one of these almond ground crickets, sometimes they make a funny noise. The meerkat says, okay, don't worry and moves on. And the next meerkat comes along and just sort of grabs them and eats them. So I think it's a taste preference. Uh, amongst meerkats because not all of them eat them but some within some of the groups eat them. I'm not too sure. I've never seen a squirrel eating them but uh, yeah I don't know if they'd taste too nice either. Nice uh, nice bug. So they, they're also busy feeding on flowers, the leaves. There's a lot of them here. The ground is just moving in alive uh, at the moment with them. They're very pretty. Uh, we've got, uh, they're actually eating a lot of, uh, maybe, you can follow me this side. Um, yeah, I don't know, are you managing there? So this one is a devil's thorn, which uh, there's lots of uh, insects that are eating. There's actually even a blister beetle inside this one. I know that's probably a little bit too far for the zoom on the camera, but uh, when you've got a bright yellow flower like this in the nature, it attracts all sorts of insects uh, in order to be pollinated. But uh, sometimes the petals also become a food source for beetles. Lots of the different beetles actually eat the poor petals of the flowers. Um, and then uh, it's got nothing to attract the other beetles. So I have to be very careful with the blister beetle. This particular species, um, they're known as the gray blister beetle. And, uh, They'll secrete like a, a like a chemical. It's called cathedin, which is a blistering agent. Uh, get blister on the skin. That chemical remains active in that blister. So they always say it's not advisable to pop that blister because as soon as you spread that chemical further on the skin, then that section will also blister. So it's uh, not the most pleasant thing to be. Um, Oh, how would you say, it's not quite to have an encounter, put it that way, have an encounter with uh, one of the blister beetles. All of the flowers are finished. We get uh, the thorns that start coming out. I don't see any, but uh, like a hard thing with lots of different little spikes that land up getting stuck uh, in your feet uh, and they get transported to all sorts of different areas by the mammals. What else is around? Let's see if we can find something else. We just, uh, nope, 
there's just elan beans I can hear oh, somebody's been digging here let's see sorry FC you're gonna have to repeat that question it didn't come through at all So Cizé is asking, has the weather influenced the number of insects that have come out, if I understand it correctly? Um, yes, it does, because uh, if you've had heavy rains and the conditions have been very good, then the insects can multiply and all the eggs that they've laid hatch. Uh, and we've had huge successes with uh, the butterflies. A, a few weeks or months ago, it was the brown veined whites. Now the common vagrant uh, is a lot. This armored ground cricket is a lot. So you definitely do have, the insects do fluctuate according to how successful uh, the weather is. And that also then in turn allows other animals like squirrels, meerkats with babies. Uh, they can also be more successful because then there is uh, a greater abundance of food. And also the more insects, then you have more of the flowers. Uh, if you've had really good rains, everything takes that opportunity to flower. Uh, and then you've got more pollinators running around uh, doing their job. So insects incredibly important and often overlooked in an environment for how important they are firstly as a as a food source but then also as a form of uh, pollinating pollinating um, the flowers as well as sometimes even carrying the seeds underneath the ground and almost planting uh, that seed so grass seeds, you just have a look at all the grass seeds. I mean, ants collect the grass seeds, take those underneath the ground, effectively put them uh, under cover. And then as soon as you've had good rains, good conditions, the soil gets nice and wet, those grass seeds uh, pop up. I mean, this area here with all this uh, sour grass that's standing quite nice and tall, uh, a few months ago was just bare soil. So those seeds have to come from somewhere. Uh, and sometimes it's the insects that have actually taken them down below. These squirrels are definitely having a lazy morning, not uh, heading out uh, too far this morning. We'll, um, we'll uh, move on down the road and see uh, if there's uh, anything else that we can uh, show you this morning. Tammy is commenting that there seems to be a lot of squirrels in Tualu. Yep, absolutely, agreed. And they're also very successful. And uh, you know, we're seeing sort of groups five, eight, uh, and then uh, well spread out all over that. But there's obviously a function for that. You know, if you've got lots of squirrels and you've got uh, something that's uh, there's enough food for them, so it is uh, it is a good thing. Everybody has their place in nature. But we're also quite lucky in that we see them easily because they're living out uh, in these open clearings uh, where they've also got very good visibility of what's going on around them. And they can be quite incredibly quick. So a squirrel, if a squirrel sees a predator, they'll actually quite quickly sort of dash down the road and then they use their tail. So their tail goes one way, their body goes the other way, and it's almost uh, a little bit distracting. Uh, and they try and get away from a predator relatively quickly and then generally to um, a hole quite close by. new flower yeah maybe we can do these ones they're quite pretty so there's a nice new flower here well new for the season so we're just going to quickly show you uh, just a beautiful picture of a nice i think this one's nice just a morning glory one of the uh, creepers uh, that are covering the ground here we uh, gonna send you across to somebody that's got something else nice to show you
Welcome back everybody. Now, currently sitting in the riverbed and there's a few southern carmine bee eaters that are sitting in the riverbed with us here. Yeah? They're looking incredibly beautiful. Their little carmine or red throats. There's actually a few of them around. This one's just the easiest one to look at at the moment. You see how its head's kind of moving around? It's sitting in the sand hunting, essentially. And they feed on all sorts of flying insects that are flying around. You'll often see them kind of fly up catch one maybe move around there are some that are flying around in the background they're very tricky to get so let's see if this one does you see how it looks up like that it also gets a, a really good view there's another one in the road there head moving around pop it up towards the sky it's often got gets a good silhouette of a of an insect as it's flying by against the sky and that'll give it a good chance to fly up and kind of hunt and take it out then the reason that I came into the riverbed here is we are at that position where that lioness has been keeping her cubs and from yesterday morning, I'm sure you all remember, I've come in and I've just been sitting here for the past 20 minutes or so, just waiting, trying to see if we can't find any kind of action of her coming back. So as Odie will zoom in onto that side there, that's exactly where we had them yesterday and i'm sure she's currently got them stashed in those buffalo thorns just on the right hand side but i've decided to come around into the river but it looks like it's going to be a great view if she does bring them down it will be awesome to see them again see the condition of them it actually smells that when it, when we drove past on the other side it smells like and apparently there was a carcass there liam how high can these birds fly uh, they can fly pretty high in terms of meters. I'm not a hundred percent certain. However, they are migrants as well. So when they are migrating, it'll be much easier for them to fly um, larger distances when they get much higher up. The air is much thinner. It's a similar kind of effect to an aeroplane. When they're flying long distances, the higher they go up, the, the thinner the air and the less fuel they'll consume. The same thing with these birds. I mean, the higher they fly, the less oxygen, which makes it a little bit tricky for them to breathe. But the thinner the air and the less kind of energy they'll use. So the one has flown a little bit. Does it come closer to us? No, not really. And so it was quite interesting. They will also feed on butterflies and flying insects like that. There was a butterfly that just flew past this one and it wasn't, it didn't decide to take it and it looked like an African monarch butterfly. And the reason it wouldn't have taken the monarch butterflies is because they actually feed on milkweed plants and that can make them poisonous. There's a, looks like a lilac breasted roller there as well, doing exactly the same thing as that carmine bee eater just feeding. Is it a European or is it a lilac? Let me just have a look past it lilac breasted rona it's looking a little bit dull that purple throat but a little bit smaller than the european roller there are quite a few around at the moment a little bit smaller there must be a little bit of an um, insect hatching around here with all these insect eating birds and as i was saying when we drove past that den site on the other side where we viewed them from yesterday it smelt like there was in fact a carcass around there that'll be very interesting to see if the mother keeps the cubs there with that presence of the carcass now that it's starting to smell quite strong and as the wind changes direction i've just got a, a quick whiff of it now as well it's not an ideal den site anymore with a carcass close by and the reason for that is that smell that is around here will travel and will attract all sorts of other kinds of predators which will endanger those cubs so while we sit here and wait i'm going to send you over to lauren with some elephants Why am I not getting that information that we are live? I thought Davi was teasing me there. We were actually off the vehicle looking for more insects on quarantine. I am desperate to find a flower mantis. 
desperate is on the top of my bucket list. Last year we were not successful. They didn't appear to be around last year. Not one was found. And this year I'm not having much luck either. That's my mission, a flower mantis. But we got lucky by this herd of elephants just appearing on quarantine. So of course we quickly got back on the vehicle. It seems to be a really small herd. It seems to be one adult. And the rest are all youngsters. My guess would be that this, this, or these individuals have just split from the rest of the herd. As youngsters of all ages, teenagers, very, very small calf, and then, of course, a large female. And quarantine's easy to feed on. You don't have to bash your way through the thicket. You can just casually stroll along and take up all the grass. There's so much grass here. It's never ending. And that's why I think almost every day now we're finding elephants on quarantine. I do miss the bushwalk days. Where you could just walk on quarantine and have elephants on foot. It's quite a magical experience. There's only four of them. Look at the different sizes there. Isn't that lovely seeing them all lined up like that? It's very difficult to gauge the age of an elephant. We get asked that question a lot. It's not easy. And to be perfectly honest, you can only do just that and try to gauge the age. Unless you've known the elephant since birth, it's going to be very difficult to put a precise number on that. When I just want to check, I've still got you. I. There we go. Lucas, you're asking how do you tell their gender? Also, not so easy. I think for adults, it's quite easy. If you see an elephant adult on its own, you can almost safely assume that it's a bull, like we had this morning. The bulls and cows, once they reach a certain age, they develop different body shapes. So from a distance, you probably can identify the body shape. But as soon as you see an adult like this one here, look for the mammary glands. It's one of the most prominent features that you will see in a female cow. These swollen mammary glands, just like that, and immediately you will know that it's female. The testicles of a male are actually inside, and they're very high up. If Davi can just show you, this is obviously a female, but the arch of the female's back, if you imagine this was a male, that's where the testicles would be. They call this test conda. It's a very interesting sort of phenomena. Why on earth are they on the inside? So that's why it's tricky to tell. You can't immediately look at genitals and know. Now with the youngsters, that's the tricky part. But normally between the males and females, they have different shaped foreheads. The sort of forehead of a female is very angular, it's very sharp, it's almost like a 90 degree point. You see that right there. And for a male, there's no sort of sharp bend, it's just a very smooth, rounded forehead. That's another key feature that you can look for. But in the youngsters, it's very, very difficult. Unless they extend their penis and make it obvious, it's not so easy to tell in the youngsters. But the adults, it's fairly obvious. And that's the best way to identify the gender. Now, they don't quite understand in science why the testicles are inside. It's the same with hippos and the same with rhinos. Flam, I don't know how much protein they get from the grass, I'm afraid. They will get protein. It'll be digested in a completely different way. Cellulose is not easy to break down. You need a special enzyme, special enzyme called cellulase to break down cellulose, and it's not easy. But once the sort of food 
that they eat is broken down completely, it'll be in the form of amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein. But as for how much protein, I'm sorry, I don't know. I always find elephant sightings like this really relaxing. Sometimes it's just nice to sit and take it all in. Rosemary, yes, it's a very beautiful scene. You can hear that noise, that's a lilac breasted roller. And also the starlings. Alison, yes, there's lots of marulas. We're on quarantine. And quarantine is actually one of the best sort of areas in the reserve to find marula trees. So, yes, we're surrounded by them. That's one right there that Davi's given you a view of at that sort of strange angle. There you go. But not all marula trees produce fruits. They're dioecious, which means that there's a male tree and a female tree separately. And it's only the female trees that produce the fruit. But quarantine is definitely one of the best places to find marula trees, which is good for us. Because we just drive by and we can stop and pick up all the fruit. They won't just be feeding on marula fruits during the summer, that'll just be a nice, sweet treat for them. Lolly, they don't actually eat the bark. So when you see elephants debarking trees and they're pulling off that outer bark, which is in fact dead, the bark that you're looking at is definitely not alive. What they're trying to do is get into the inner parts of the bark, the parts that are alive. And we call this the cambium layer. And the cambium layer is a sort of system in the tree that contains the most nutrition. The trees are photosynthesizing all the time. They're making their own nutrition from the sunlight. They're also drawing up their own water with their roots. And this is exactly what the elephants are trying to get to when they're debarking the tree. It's the alive part of the tree. When we look at the bark, that outer bark of the marula, it's really unique. The That's actually dead. That's the dead part. Once it dies, it moves to the outside. And that's what the elephants are trying to get to, the cambium layer on the inside that we can actually see. And it's tissue. It's a tissue layer. And it contains most of the tree's cells for growth. Now you have the xylem and the phloem. And they are the sort of channels that the tree transports this material. So it has to transport the water that it pulls up from the roots up to the leaves. And it has to transport all the nutrition that is forming from photosynthesis in the leaves down to the roots. So there's a constant transport system going on here that we can't see. And the cambium layer is found in between the xylem and the phloem. And that's where all the nutrition is. And I can imagine that it tastes so delicious. So we're going to sit with these elephants just a little while longer.
If you love to watch Wild Earth, then we are inviting you to join our Explorers program. For a monthly subscription, you will have the opportunity to win fantastic Wild Earth expeditions, join our guides for a chat around the fire, receive weekly highlights from our shows, and much more. All the money will go to keeping these live safaris on air, which in turn allows us to escape into nature every single day. Being a safari driver requires some serious multitasking ability. You've got to be able to talk, look at the road, steer, and occasionally get the vehicle into the right gear. Do not crash into any trees. Oh, Just jump into the car and hope for the best, and you'll see where it takes you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm surprised they're moving as fast as them. <laughs> that didn't go well. Who is the best driver? Well, me, of course, although some of the cam ops might disagree. My name is Lauren and I'm currently working in Juma Private Game Reserve here in South Africa. I love answering your questions during the live safaris. It's my favorite part. It feels like you're on the vehicle with me and I'm able to teach you exactly what you want to know. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, then you need to register on our website. Once registered, you must go to the live safari page and ask your question below the live feed. Um, something very, very interesting. I didn't plan this, but this is a scene, uh, rarely seen. This is what we call a journey of giraffe. So beautiful. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. Africa is very special and when you come down here, even when you're watching through our camera, the landscapes have changed from desert to bush felt to up in the Masai Mara where there's grassland. That means that the biodiversity changes as we move along Africa. And what I love most about connecting with you guys is the fact that I get to share these wonderful experiences with thousands of people. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. Elephants are still here, moving slowly and slowly, a little bit closer to the car. And you can see, well, I think it's disappeared, but the fork-tailed drongos are never too far away. From large herbivores, at least. I think it shows remarkable intelligence to know to follow the herbivores because they disturb the soil below. They disturb the ground. Ah, there's... It keeps on darting away. And they know that they're going to be in store for a delicious insect treat. Starlings sometimes do this as well, but it's mostly the drongos. And they just follow. They follow large herbivores. And immediately, using their eyesight, they've got very, very keen eyesight. Look at it, watching. As soon as they see whatever insect treat they're after, they dive bomb in behind it. They're not scared of the elephants. They know that it's a great way to get food. It's starlings there as well. I wonder if it's after the same thing. The elephants, of course, are not disturbing the insects intentionally. They just do this as they're moving in summer. Look at that one. That's very brave. Now, before I forget, we're nearing the end of the show. Today's a very special day. It is a Sunday and it is naming day for the Juma clan. Please do join us this afternoon. Hopefully, the hyena den will be active. And if it's active, we will be given names to the cubs. All cubs except Ntimas will be given a name. And there will be options for you as viewers to give your opinion and help us choose. So please do join in. We've got a wonderful selection for you all, given from lots of stakeholders in the area. So I'm very, very excited about this afternoon. It's about time our little cubs got some names. That clan is growing. I don't know how I'm going to keep up with them all once they all get spotty. 
and it's been a wonderful morning. From insects to elephants to the Lofeld's smallest carnivore, we've at least had a great drive. And we're not too far from home. One minute away from breakfast. So everyone, thank you so much for jumping on board. It's always a pleasure to have you here for all your comments and all your questions. And please do join us this afternoon. We will be out as usual for our sunset safari. So until then, have a great day.